Hey everyone, welcome to another weekly Ask Us Anything. It's just me this week. Uh, Derek is out of town, but we got two questions. We were asked about anything. And so here we are in our studio in Derek's office. We're still stealing his office, even though he's out of town. So here's the first question. Based on Jesus's illustration, have you ever been the one with a speck in your eye? And conflict arose and you dutifully examined the log in your own eye and you humbly apologized for the wrongs you did that you couldn't see but didn't receive the same grace from the other person. Any general advice for a messy situation with a lot of judgmentalism coming at you? So again, this is a great question. We, we talked on, on Sunday about um, how Jesus calls us to avoid the two extremes of condemnation and condoning. And uh, we talked about how we're neither to condemn to have the log in our own eye, nor to just condone the speck in someone else's eye. But this person is really asking a good question because I think more often than not, when we do what Jesus asks us to do and we um, take out the log, the wood beam of our own eye, and we look to our neighbor and say, hey, you know, like there is a speck in your eye. When we basically try to do what Paul tells us in Galatians 6, which is, if any one of us is caught in transgression, uh, you who are spiritual should restore them in a spirit of humility and, um, and grace. But what if the person doesn't, you know, respond well? So I think what we should first do, again, is, is still really consider, is this person right? Um, we, sh- we should always start, especially if it's a brother or sister in Christ, which is what this passage is, the first part of the passage is about, is we should give them the benefit of the doubt, always. We should always assume that our own hearts are deceiving us. Uh, we should always start with uh, the, the part of the person's critique or pushback that we think has the most credibility. So even if you think the person's 90% wrong, start with the 10% that you think they may be right. And really just ask first, am I overreacting? Do I have a spirit of gentleness? Did I come in a little too hot? Um, really try to practice what um, counselors say is uh, metacognition, which is you sit above yourself, uh, um, kind of analyzing yourself, uh, really saying, how did I appear to that person? Um, am I being caught in the sin, to use the phrase from Paul, by being angry? So you just continue to reflect and consider where they may be right. Now, if you do all this, you, you continue to examine uh, your own heart and you, you really just think it, you know, they're really just stuck in that speck uh, that's in their eye. They're really um, caught in that transgression. I feel like you, you do one thing before you move on to uh, a process. The, you, you pray for them and you give them a little bit of time. I think you be clear. You say, hey, I, I really thought about it. I prayed about it. And I really, I do think, I love you, brother or sister, but I do think that there's this issue in your life. Um, and you just, you give it time and you, you, you give it more reflection on your own part, but then you clearly state in a spirit of gentleness um, what you see in their life. And, you, and maybe even point to scripture where you say, hey, I'm not trying to condemn you. I'm not trying to be against you. I'm for you. You kind of, you anticipate the fear that they might have in their own heart. Because um, whenever someone's pushing back, whenever someone's defensive about uh, a biblical correction, uh, me- meaning correction and a spirit of gentleness, whenever someone's defensive, it's usually because of an insecurity they have. So to whatever degree you can name that insecurity, to whatever degree you can name that fear, uh, maybe someone in the past has um, critiqued them or condemned them, and they are projecting that past person onto you, to whatever degree you can kind of name that fear and say, look, I am not against you. I am for you. I love you. And because I love you, because I'm for you, I I want to help you uh, with with this. Now, what if they still, you know, continue on? I do think this is where Jesus's instructions in Matthew 18 uh, are are the most helpful. And we we did a sermon series, if you remember, last summer um, on the means of grace. And one of the sermons we preached was on this passage on church discipline. And this is what Jesus says. He says, if your brother or sister sins against you, you need to go and tell them their fault between you and him alone. I've already done that. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. So again, if the person's like, you know, you're right. You don't, you don't bring it up again. You forgive them. But, you know, Jesus is realistic. He assumes that, you know, sin exists. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. So Jesus is giving us very specific instructions here. He says, bring someone 
that is not just going to show partiality to you, bring someone that you're both close to, maybe even go to someone, again, this all assumes you're in the same church community, that is closer to them um, and bring them in. And, and again, the spirit is not gossip. It's, it's for, uh, for um, edification. And it's to say, hey, other person, third party, um, do you see this in this person's life? I'm trying to lovingly restore them. Now, they may say at that point, no, I think you're wrong. Maybe get a, another person's opinion there. But I would say if they say you're wrong, then you should probably listen um, to that person. Um, okay, let's say you get the person. They're like, yeah, you're right. One or two others. Um, the, everyone's in agreement. The person's still not listening. Um Jesus says, verse 17 of chapter 18, if he refuses to listen to them, that is the, you know, two or three, then tell it to the church. And again, I don't think he means like on a Sunday morning, stand up and say, you know, so-and-so is being an idiot or something like that. I think there, we understand that to be the elders of the church. Um, and so I think that's where it's it's good to bring in an elder or two, or maybe even the whole session to... Um, to that person. And this is just a good reason why everyone should be church members is because that person who, let's just say the person is still not seeing the speck in their own eye. If the elders are brought in at this point and the elders are of the opinion that the person is in habitual unrepentant sin, which is what we're really talking about here. And the elders uh, basically give a formal admonition. Hey, brother or sister, like we, we, we see this person, this has been brought to us our attention and we think there's credibility and this ongoing habitual sin that you're doing. And it seems as if you're unrepentant and we, as your elders, um, whom according to the fifth membership vow, you've taken a vow of submission of, of saying, I believe in the elders to not be infallible, but to, to hold me accountable. Um, and that is kind of the last resort. Uh, again, this doesn't happen overnight. This happens usually over many months. Um, the elders don't just, you know, go zero to 100 real quick. There's a lot of admonitions. There's a lot of one-on-ones. But again, um, Jesus says, if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him to be, be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Basically meaning not that you become utterly rude to the person, but that... Um, they're basically excluded from the church community. Um, the, the elders are essentially making real through excommunication what the person is already doing. By saying, by the person saying, I am not in the wrong, I am completely, completely right. They are actually excluding themselves, I think, from the church community. The elders are more so just signing off on the exclusion. Because by saying, I don't have any sin and everyone in my community is wrong, it's to say, I don't want to be a part of the community. Because to be a part of the community basically is a mutual submission. If you're in marriage, you have a mutual submission. Husband and wife submit to one another, as Paul says in Ephesians 5. Um, to be in a friendship, you're in a mutual submission. But to be in a covenant community, you mutually submit to one another. So by you know going to that nth degree and never, ever listening, you are excluding yourself from the community. And the elders are saying, um, you are essentially not in this community anymore. We, we want you to repent. We are always, we are quick to forgive and quick to restore. Should you do one thing and one thing only, which is to say, you know what? You're right. I was in the wrong. I, I do have a speck in my eye. Um, thank you. That's it. It's not like you have to do penance. It's not like you have to sweep the church or something like that uh, in order to get back in. It's, it's just repentance. Boom. They're in simple. Um, and I think Jesus uh, in Matthew 18 really wants this to be a communal endeavor. Um, so I think that's an encouraging thing. It, it basically says that um, you are called to practice self-reflection a lot when you correct someone else um, humbly. Um, but at the end of the day, we are meant to do that as a community. Uh, and, and the elders are kind of brought in as a last resort. We as the elders want to be more proactive and we hope that it never gets to that. And that final um, situation of excommunication, and it rarely, rarely does. Uh, but we, we want to be able to help in that way. But I, I think th those are just some um, thoughts with that question. But it is hard. It is, it is very challenging when someone is very resistant, especially when it is uh, a loved you know friend, when it is someone that you're really close to, when it's someone that maybe you have a re strong relationship outside of organized church gathered activities. Uh, but love is painful. Love is messy. And then I, I hope that we are all, even through the weekly liturgy, through daily prayer, 
um, practicing self-examination to where we are quick to repent. That even when someone brings a charge against us that we're pretty sure they're it, like, we don't think they're right. We, we take seriously every single correction that is brought against us. So I hope that even weekly confessions of sin um, and may, hopefully even daily confessions of sin help with that. But again, it is a tricky process. So that's the first question. Second question is, you quoted something I've heard before. God gives us what we would have asked for if we knew everything he knows. I get where this is coming from, but I don't fully agree because of the broken world we live in. This person says, maybe I can say in some circumstances it was better that I had to wait instead of getting what I wanted right when I asked for it. Maybe I can be grateful for the character produced through suffering, but I wouldn't ask for the pain. Jesus endured the pain of the cross, but he also asked for it to be removed. Given the horrible evil and suffering in the world, can't we say that God works things together for good without saying we would choose the exact path that is laid out for us? End quote of the question. So it's a really, really good question. And um, I think that I'm glad the person asked it because the, again, part of the reason why we do this um, is one, we value questions, but two, that if, if you've ever preached a sermon or you've ever even taught a lesson on anything complicated, you know that there you can't say everything you want to say. And because of the nature of the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus kind of moves through topics so quickly, a topic like prayer and more specifically unanswered prayer is, is really something that deserves a lot more than I think I gave it maybe 10 minutes in point two. And you really, you know, you probably should write a book on, on the topic, not me, but like, I think there's a book length topic, uh, uh, that would need to be addressing that specific issue. So I will actually qualify what I said, meaning that I think this person rightly critiques something I said. I said, if we knew everything God knew, we wouldn't, we would ask for what God gives us. I want to add a qualifier. If we knew everything God knew and we were, we had Jesus's perfect will. So if we knew everything God did, I still think we would choose the easy path because we're, we're, um, our wills are bent. Um, we will always choose the path, choose the path of least resistance, even if it means, um, it isn't good for us. So, I mean, we do this every day, right? We know that exercising and eating vegetables is objectively better for us a hundred times out of a hundred, maybe, I don't know, 99 times out of a hundred than, you know, eating a thing of ice cream and not exercising. Yet how many times do we choose to eat the thing of ice cream? I mean, like we love it, right? Um, so we know a lot of things that we still choose to not do. So all that to say, if we knew everything God knew, which we don't, and we had Jesus's perfect will, I think we would choose um, what he wants. Now, this person, I think, would still maybe push back to say, I, I still don't think I would choose uh, the pain. It, but so, I, And they mentioned Jesus, which I think is a really good example. So I want to actually just dial in on that uh, example of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. What did he really mean when he said, not my will, but your will be done. I think he is saying what I'm saying, meaning I think that Jesus is not saying when he, when he is saying, father, all things are possible for you. Um, please take this cup from me. I don't think he is saying, I don't want to die for the sins of the people. I think what Jesus is saying is that if there is in, I, I don't want hell in and of itself. Cause you got to think about what he is about to, you know, experience. I don't want the worst possible thing that could happen to me. But what he is saying is I want something more. Um, I want um, to bring in God's people. You know, I'll just, we'll quote scripture here. He Hebrews 12 two. Jesus, the founder and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, what was the joy? We've talked about this before. It was bringing in people, a people that he had chose from, uh, from eternity past, from all nations, all ethnicities, through all time. He saw that people. I love the, the, the way um, one hymn put it. I think it was. From heaven he came and sought her. Uh, that is his bride, his church. For the joy that was set before him of uniting a people to himself, he, dis, um, he, he, he endured the cross, despised the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. So right there in Hebrews 12, too, you have this tension 
Uh, did Jesus want the pain in and of itself? No, absolutely not. Do we want the pain in and of itself? Um, if we knew everything God did and we had Jesus' perfect will? No, but we would want the pain in the grand scheme of things. Jesus, at the end of the day, chose the cross for the joy set before him. Um, he endured it. Um, Jesus is not going to the cross as, Father, please don't let me have it. Please, any other, no, 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 no. We, we, don't, we don't need to understand um, Jesus's will being against the Father's will. We, we need to see that when Jesus says, not my will, he's saying that I have a perfect human will, but I'm going to submit it to the Father. Um, now, this gets into the question that we're getting nitty gritty theology here, but I think it's really helpful. Um, did Jesus have a different will from the Father? Um, you'll be maybe intrigued to find out that the church debated this a lot. There was um, a debate at the leading up to the sixth council, uh, the sixth ecumenical council, I think it was in Constantinople in uh, 681. Yep. The sixth ecumenical council, the third council in Constantinople, um, the church um, confessed. So I'm just going to quote something from the Catholic catechism. Now we would agree with this uh, because this is, you know, just church tradition teaching. This is the Catholic Catechism. Similarly, at the Sixth Ecumenical Council, Constantinople 3 and 681, the church confessed that Christ possessed two wills and two natural operations, divine and human. They are not opposed to each other, but cooperate in such a way that the word made flesh willed humanly in obedience to the Father, all that he had decided divinely with the Father and the Holy Spirit for our salvation. Christ's human will does not resist or oppose, but rather submits to his divine and almighty will. Okay, so again, nitty gritty theology here, but Fourth Ecumenical Council at Chalcedon, and again, the Ecumenical Councils are just, um, I think, inspired interpretations of infallible scripture. They could be wrong, but I think when God's people gather together, um, it's not infallible as scripture is, but it's the highest interpretation of what scripture can be. Um, so you have the ecumenical councils, you have something like, you know, the Westminster Confession of Faith. They're, they're gatherings of God's people. They're not on par with scripture, but they should be interpreted. Um, they should be given an elevated status of interpretation of scripture because it's God's people coming together. Um, and at that time, it was all of God's people coming together. And they denounced a heresy. I'm blanking on the name of it. Um, it's either monophysitism or monothelitism. I want to say monothelitism because it would be one will uh, versus two will. And there was a group of people saying that Jesus only had one will. It was a divine and human will combined. But the Sixth Ecumenical Council denied that because they said, based on the Fourth Ecumenical Council, that Jesus had two natures. He's one person, one divine person with a true human nature and a true divine nature. And they are inseparable throughout his whole life and now, you know, he's still, you know, incarnate with his resurrected body in heaven. Um, they're not blended together like some kind of divine protein shake, uh, but they're never separated. They're never uh, dissolved together. They're never separated. So they're distinct yet unified. It's a key phrase in theology, distinct yet unified. Human nature, divine nature. Now, each nature, in order to be a true nature, has to have a will that corresponds with it. So in order for Jesus, this is the Sixth Ecumenical Council meditating on scripture, they said, in order for Jesus to have a true human nature, he also has to have a true human will. Otherwise, you're not truly human if you don't have a human will. But in order to be a divine person, he also has a divine will. Um, so the divine will is unified. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have one will. It's not like the father is over here saying, son, I really want you to die. And the son's like, no, dad, like some rebellious teenager. No, that's not the father, son, and Holy Spirit from all of eternity have one will. Now, Jesus, when he assumes humanity, he also assumes a human will. And that will is never against the father's will, but it is distinct from the father and the son and the Holy Spirit's will um, is divine. So you have two distinct wills, the will of God and father, son, and Holy Spirit, which the son has being fully God as the second person of the training God and the human will of Jesus. Now in the garden of Gethsemane, this is all theological nitty gritty background to what's happening at the garden. The human will of Jesus is, which is neutral in a sense, uh, meaning it, um, it, it um, how do I put it? It, it? it chooses to submit to the, 
the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit's will. Um, and so all that to say, when we are thinking about uh, just a theoretical experiment of if we knew everything God knew and we were made perfectly righteous as if Jesus is, if we had Jesus's human will, I think we would do what Jesus did, which is to say, Lord, I don't want to experience this pain that I'm about to experience or that I have experienced. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours. I realize that there is a joy set before me. I don't know what it is. Like Jesus knew what it was, um, but I am willing to go through it um, because I trust you, Father, as Jesus did. And here's the thing. We will one day say what Jesus did. We will one day actually know what God knows, not as God knows it, not perfectly. And we won't become God, but I do think we will see things in a way um, similar to God's perspective. In the new creation, we will see the grand story in a way that we don't see now. And our wills will be made um, like Jesus's will is now. Uh, We will no longer desire to sin. So a better way to put it would be in the new creation, when we look back on our lives, when we look back on the grand history of everything, I don't think we will fault God. I don't think we'll say, God, yeah, you really dropped the ball in writing the story of creation. I would have totally wrote it differently. We will agree joyfully. I think even the scars themselves will be undone. Um, and we will, I think, begin to have understanding. We won't get that this side of eternity. You should not, you know, look at your individual sufferings and try to correlate them with some meaning behind them. I think uh, this person wisely said the phrase together. That's what Paul says in Romans eight twenty eight. God works all things together. Um, so there may be an individual scene in a movie that's horrible. And that doesn't necessarily have any redeeming qualities, but when it's seen in the whole story, um, then it has its redeeming qualities. Um, And so again, I think we would accept the pain if we know it leads to something better. We do this all the time, right? In our lives, we accept shots from the doctor. Um, When Jasper got his shots recently at his four month checkup, he, you know, had no idea why he was going through the pain. And if he had the ability to um, ask the question, he would have said, why are my unloving parents giving me these shots? Um, hepatitis doesn't seem that bad or I don't even know what they gave him, but he he doesn't get it. You know, he doesn't understand that um, we're doing this because we love him. Uh, We do this when we go through surgery or maybe like maybe you experience pain of working, working for a lot of us, you know, it it may have elements that are painful. Uh, Now you'll go through that pain for the reward, whether that's the intrinsic reward of your work or maybe the the money to provide for your family or the larger good in society. But we all go through some elements of pain that we wouldn't necessarily choose in and of themselves, but together taken with the whole story, I do think we would choose them. Now, again, that's really hard when you look at like horrible things like suffering and cancer. And I don't think we're meant to logically, you know, tease those things out just with an argument. We're meant to see that Jesus meets with us. He weeps with us. Um, But at the end of the day, I think we are called to trust as Jesus did. Because again, Jesus experienced hell. When I say hell, I mean literally hell. The the Apostles' Creed said he descended into hell. And I I think what's happening is on the cross, he descended into hell. Um, And if he can trust the Father descending into hell, um, we can trust him. with our many hells, you know, because not, we'll never experience hell for those that rest in Jesus. Um, we may, you know, experience, you know, if you're ever, if you've ever been near a fire, you know, obviously know that the closer you put your hand to the fire, the hotter it gets. We may feel a little bit of the heat of hell, so to speak, but Jesus, Jesus straight got burned by that fire. Um, and so because he trusted the father being in the flames, we can trust him, you know, being near the flames. Um, and so it's hard. That's so much easier said than done. Um, but I do think we find comfort from a God who weeps with us, a God who has been where we've been. And otherwise, how else do you have hope? Um, so those are the two questions we have today and, um, keep them coming. It's great. We, we don't ever want to assume that, uh, Christianity is an easy pill to swallow. We don't ever want to assume Jesus is teaching an easy pill to swallow. And so questions are so, so good. Uh, Keep asking them, keep wrestling with them. Feel free to shoot back responses. If you don't like what you hear, you disagree. We want it's conversation. So anyway, thanks so much for tuning in today. We love you guys. Peace.